All right. Do you want to um, introduce our speaker? Yeah. 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 Um, so our first speaker is John Alspa. I don't have his bio memorized, but he's a he's an icon in the DevOps community. And yeah. You know what else he is? He's a human. Last I checked. Right? Yeah. 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 He's, he, I mean, he made it through security. So he did make it chance. through security, so it's good. Yeah. So we're all in this together, and let's hear it for John. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm really excited. Um, oh, look at that. That looks awesome. The slide came out really well. Um, so I'm really excited. And there's a lot to talk about. Hmm. The topic is, well, so a bit of disclosure. I'm here to challenge you this morning uh, on some sort of preconceived notions um, as I sort of talk about resilience engineering and resilience. Um, the, uh, the idea here is to provide fuel, like, um, uh, like Nathan Holly mentioned, to provide fuel for your conversations later, okay? Um, I'll talk about this in a little bit. Resilience engineering is a field. Is it possible that somebody could do a 40-minute talk on a field of science? I mean, I don't know if, you, if I were you, if I would believe me if I could do that. Um, so again, this is going to be fuel uh, for discussion. Um, so I'm going to do sort of a little bit of mixture of snippets and perhaps some sort of controversial challenge your thinking in some paradigms perspectives. Um, so uh, a quick uh, slide about me. Here are some things that I've written um, and places that I've worked. Um, a funny thing. Uh, so I gave this talk, and there was a, a not great talk. It was a great talk as far as a duet talk was concerned with my friend Paul in 2009. Um, and uh, at the time, it was really weird. It wasn't clear to us. Paul and I thought, we're going to talk about what we do, like what our perspective is at Flickr um, around this idea that there's, hey, maybe it's possible that um, developers and operations engineers could like work co collaboratively to support each other um, and like, like help further each other's, you know, uh, you know, distance towards goals and like cope with constraints and that sort of thing. It was pretty wild and really not used to, the software industry wasn't really used to. In fact, there were a lot of people who came up to us after that talk and said, I think you're a lunatic. Like, you all are bananas. Like, this, and deploying multiple times a day, you all should, at least one person said, you should both be fired. Because we thought that's how radical it was. But it was an exciting time. Six months later, um, um, Patrick Dubois um, held the first uh, DevOps days at Ghent. Um, Patrick says there were some, uh, there were a handful of things that we said were, that were, that were, that he enjoyed. Um, uh, so I just want to throw that out there. The topic of resilience engineering, I believe, is similar in that there's something happening. Uh, and I'm going to explain that. Um, but right now, there's something that's happening. Resilience engineering as a concept, resilience as a concept, and resilience engineering as a practice, as a field, as a community, is still almost entirely unknown. And I could give probably conference talks all day, every day, and it would still be unknown for a, a long time. But there are glimmers of hope and some progress being made. So thank you for listening to me. Um, uh, this doesn't really matter. Um, I, oh, um, I'm part of a, a consortium. Uh, we're finishing up the second cycle, an academic and industry consortium called the Snafu Catchers. Um, and if anybody wants to talk to me later um, about uh, your company being part of the third cycle, um, I would love to talk about that. And here's the company that I work for at the moment. OK, so here's my goal. If you walk away from this talk with any answers, that's going to be purely coincidental. My intention here is to not give you answers. My intention here is to, is to, uh, is to help you ask better questions and lay out some threads that you could pull on um, elsewhere uh, afterwards, maybe in the open spaces, um, to ask sort of better questions about resilience and resilience engineering. So here is, here's the deal. Uh, summary slide, 
all oversimplified, but we'll revisit this later. Resilience engineering is a very relatively recent field aiming to create and sustain conditions where resilience can manifest productively. We'll talk about resilience later. Whoops. Uh, resilience is something that a system, and by system I mean your organization, not your software, it's something that a system does, not what a system has. It's not a property, it's not a state. Resilience is, in another way of putting it, sustained adaptive capacity, sometimes referred to as continuous adaptability, sometimes referred to as graceful extensibility, to unforeseen situations. These are just vocabulary words to sort of set the stage for your, for, to have conversations. Um, and it's mostly important to set it aside from other paradigms that you're used to. And then lastly, I'm gonna end with some, the, the, to, to say that it's our world of software, the software sort of industry at large, has some unique opportunities that other domains who have been involved in resilience engineering don't have. But there are some, I wouldn't say significant, but some, certainly some uh, real challenges um, that face to make some progress on that. So resilience engineering. I'm gonna talk about the field community, and then I'm gonna talk about what this practice looks like. Um, I'm not gonna talk about what that practice looks like very much, um, uh, mostly because it's a sort of a stage setting. In order to talk about what it means to engineer resilience, I have to really s sort of explore a little bit with you what, what I mean by that. It is an overloaded term, uh, much like DevOps, much like Agile, much like a lot of terms. Um, and first, I want to wipe away a bunch of either pre preconceived notions or potential points of confusion. So, let me tell you what resilience engineering is not first. It's not SRE, it's not DevOps, it's not something invented by a particular company, it's not chaos engineering, although it's becoming closely related to, in a number of different ways, if we have time we'll, we can talk about that, um, to chaos engineering. It's not automation either. So. I want to set aside, remember, there's resilience and then there's resilience engineering. I want to sort of make a sort of distinction there. In that vein, resilience is not redundancy, it's not robustness, it's not high availability, it's not fault tolerance, it's actually, literally, it's nothing about software or hardware. A resilience in the frame of resilience engineering which emerged sometime in the 2000s, early 2000s, is not a synonym for these things. It's something different. It's something beyond a second order, higher order uh, concept here. So it's a field and a community. Uh, multidisciplinary, largely came from a field known as the sort of the origins of resilience engineering came from a field known as cognitive systems engineering, which you could think of somewhat of a punk rock slash splinter of uh, what's now what's known as traditional human factors, early 2000s, largely inspired um, cognitive systems engineers to start thinking about this uh, um, as they uh, as they investigated and sort of explored a couple of NASA incidents at the time. Um, uh, eight symposia um, against uh, with this sort of community. I'm wrong. This is about 15 years here, and here are some covers of books to prove to you that. This has been a thing. Um, two weeks ago, uh, I was in Sweden for the eighth um, uh, Resilience Engineering Symposium in Kalmar, Sweden. If you have an opportunity to go to the west coast of Sweden during the summer, it's awesome. You should totally do it. Um, uh, resilience Engineering is a community. And it's largely made up of practitioners and researchers from these domains. This is what I mean by multidisciplinary. Resilience engineering and the topic of resilience in technical systems and socio-technical systems has its roots in biology and ecology, but it's largely studied in organizations from these perspectives and working in these domains. So what you'll see up here is a list of domains that are traditionally known as safety critical domains. Safety critical domains. Um, a lot of either fixing people, 
uh, moving people, providing power for people, or, I mean, I guess killing people. There's, there's, a, there's a, 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 a view that says um, human factors, the general, uh, is so much of human factors came from the military. Um, not just the U.S. military, but military. And, and that is, for the better or the worse, um, working out why somebody who was supposed to be killed didn't or somebody why somebody was killed who shouldn't have was. Um, that got dark. Sorry. Let's backtrack. Um, so you note here that I'm going to add software engineering, but this is only recent. This is very recent. Um, and it's still, like I said, there are still... Uh, uh, baby steps being made, introducing uh, the world of software into this sort of community. Um, some of the, some people, I'm hoping that maybe a handful of people um, uh, recognize some, because are any of these names people that you recognize? Raise your hand. Okay, great. Next year, it would be great if everybody worked out yeah, I've, I've seen those names and I've read those. You certainly will. I'm going to expand on this. These were sort of some of the, I guess what I would say, OGs, the sort of the heavies. Um, uh, I'm at this bottom row here. Um, uh, Nora Jones works at Slack. Casey Rosenthal um, is running a startup. Used to work at Netflix with Nora. Um, Jessica DeVito works at Microsoft. Paul Reed now works at Netflix. And there's me. Um, these are people who, uh, who went further in their career to get a degree in human factors and system safety, of which resilience engineering is inextricably linked. Um, uh, before I get too far into this, I want to mention um, this URL, resiliencepapers.club. It's maintained on a GitHub uh, account by Lauren Huckstein, uh, who's at Netflix. Um, and if there's a, um, and it's not an exactly an explainer, certainly an introduction to the topic. And, um, and various ways of sort of exploring uh, sort of both personalities who've done work in this area and the topics and concepts. So, resilience. Try to get some shared understanding here. Resilience can be described as proactive activities aimed at preparing to be unprepared. Now, this is really different than what we're used to in software. In software, we're used to, I guess, what I would call preventative design. We want to write our code. We want to uh, build our, architect our systems, our um, infrastructure, all, all of the stuff that goes into the code and supporting the code as it's running to take into account uh, scenarios that are untoward or unwanted and be able to handle them gracefully, right? Graceful degradation is a view, and a lot of the um, a lot of the the, the, the thrust be behind fault tolerance and distributed systems are in that same vein of preventative design. Okay, the difference is that resilience engineering is and resilience manifests in scenarios that are unforeseen, that were not and uh, that were not imagined as being possible in the preventative design stages. This means that you can't justify it economically. I will say this, it sounds paradoxical, but you're doing it. Resilience exists in the world whether we know how it works or not. Sustaining the potential for future adaptive action when conditions change, it's a simpler way of describing it, something a system does uh, and not what it has. Uh, perhaps a simplistic analogy. Raise your hand if you've heard of chaos engineering. All right. So a, perhaps a simplistic way of describing resilience is not what results from doing chaos experiments. It's about funding and supporting the teams that develop and perform those experiments. You see? So this unforeseen, unanticipated, right? These are hallmarks of complex systems behavior. And, it's, and resilience is aimed at setting conditions and, uh, and scenarios up so that these scenarios can be handled. And, but it's paradoxical. How do you prepare to be unprepared? This is what the community has been wrestling from a research perspective in all those other domains for about 15 years, 15, 20 years. I love this quote by Scott Sagan. Things that have never happened before happen all the time. Uh, of course, for anybody who's in charge of 
or, or responsible for production systems understands. Of course, this is exactly. Incidents in our world are effectively surprises. And so in surprises lay the seeds that we could uh, explore, try to discover, tease apart, pull apart um, in particular ways to find what resilience might look like in the wild. So I'm going to attempt to make another sort of analogy here. So robustness. I'm going to use uh, an example of vehicle sus suspension, right? Shock absorbers, right? Designed for vertical disturbances that a vehicle might experience, right? It's within a constraint, right? It's not horizontal. It's vertical. Well, in, case, in case of struts, it's a little bit horizontal. But in the case of shock absorbers, um, uh, largely for vertical disturbances, right? But it's within a range of, uh, a defined range of position and impact, right? And, and, and force of impact, which means it's designed for scene. This is the operating envelope, robustness. Robustness is what shock absorbers bring to the vehicle. Redundancy, the presence of a spare tire, right? Designed for a situation where a tire in production is blown out or otherwise needs replacing. Okay, it only it, it it helps, and you're willing to give up a decent amount of uh, of space in your trunk, uh, in the vehicle to carry it around with you. You're burning fuel because it's extra weight, but you believe that it is necessary, and so you're incurring a cost. You're sacrificing some goals in order to bring it, but in the end, it's still redundancy, right? So both of these are. Preparations for vehicle-specific situations. None of them help with congested traffic or shutdown of a particular route that you need to take or significant detours or the ill health of a driver, other challenges. Resilience could be seen in this way as the capacity of finding ways of getting to your destination and what you might need for that. So for example, when I was in Sweden, having cash in local currency, having some amount of fluency uh, in the local language, access or, or uh, an ability to get to rail and bus uh, schedules, um, an ability, uh, cell service, in order to maybe postpone my appointment, or taking it partially by phone, or having somebody else stand in for a, per for a period. So that's this higher level that resilience describes. It is not robustness. It is not redundancy. It's this higher level. See how squishy it is? It's a bit hard to get your, your, your mind wrapped around it. Another way David Woods, one of the sort of pioneers of the field, has said is that resilience is a verb. If you're using nouns, state, property, something like that, it's not likely that you're talking about resilience. Resilience is described by verbs. So sustained adaptive capacity. Otherwise, people have called it continuous adaptability, graceful extensibility. It means the system is poised. Doesn't mean, that it ha it doesn't mean that adaptation is happening, but you have an ability to, to adapt. Continuous deployment is, uh, has been seen, could has been described as a manifestation of adaptive capacity, of the potential to, to, uh, to adapt, in that you're investing a good deal to deploy, if you need to, when you need to, what you need to. Does it mean that you're deploying all the time? Of course, deploying all the time would require that you, all of these conditions be set up. But building that takes a lot of effort, right? Raise your hand if you'd say that you're part of an organization that practices continuous deployment. OK. For those with your raised hands, the, the world you lived in before continuous deployment cost less money, I mean, to deploy. Than it did. It incurred a bunch of risk and a bunch of other things, but it was very different. So this is what we mean by investing, um, and especially investing in something that you don't necessarily have a good, you know, defensible economic justification for. So can it be found in the wild? The answer is yes. And then how we look at incidents. Um, incidents uh, are. Briefly, incidents provide a number of different productive opportunities. Um, if we know how to look into them, if we know uh, what to look for and um, what to do with what we find. So 
let me start with, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about incidents and how we might be able to do that. So let's start with this. All incidents can be worse. Disagreement? Great. Um, you're my people. Um, the question then is, if all incidents can be worse, then what are the things that people are doing to prevent it from getting worse? Right? Which, generally speaking, we don't give a lot of attention to. We give a lot of attention to the things we do to fix it, maybe a handful of other details, but there are a number of different things that, that we're doing. In fact, even all the time, you're doing things to prevent incidents. Those generally don't get a lot of attention. When you do have an incident, it conveniently provides attention um, for you to, to sort of explore. But that is, the, that is the general MO. If you look at what people are doing, which normally would be seen as unremarkable or maybe described as, oh, that's good, just good engineering, or that's, oh, that's just, ex, you know, expertise, you know. Uh, she just knows what to do. She's good under pressure, you know, sort of those sort of, uh, sort of fuzzy sort of descriptions. So how could we find this? Well, first, we'd have to find incidents that have a high degree of surprise, number one. If there's no surprise, then tempo, time pressure, uh, risk of consequences um, is not very high. Um, and that's not great for a number of different reasons um, to find sources of resilience. We also want to look for incidents whose consequences were not severe. This is paradoxical, because you'd think, well, the bigger the incident, the more attention. That's actually a lie. It's actually the opposite. The more severe, more uh, visible an incident is, the greater the attention and clamor for answers quickly. A quick wrong answer, a quick simplified, oversimplified answer is always preferable, organizationally, politically, to developing an explanation for an event than a more defensible, detailed, less simple set of descriptions, unfortunately. So we look closely at the details of these sort of medium size events that have high surprise about what, could have, what, about what people were doing, how people, how people uh, work together, Di uh, diagnostic activities, therapeutic activities, um, uh, the costs of coordination between different teams or different uh, uh, expertise, how do hypotheses uh, evolve and, and change over time. And then once you, can, uh, once you can find these elements, these qualities, you want to protect them and actually bring a lot of attention to them to support them. An example is Sylvia. Everybody works with a Sylvia, and everybody knows that if this weird esoteric database thing over here that just generally runs like it's, if it's having issues, if you've been working at this company for a while, you call Sylvia. That's the answer. That's the run book. Step one, call Sylvia. And Sylvia just knows. She works. It's fluid. Whereas the rest of the team might just be like, ah, freaking out. All of a sudden, when Sylvia goes on vacation, lots of people notice. In that way, you would, you would say that this esoteric domain expertise that Sylvia has is a strength. You should be supporting Sylvia in much better explicit ways. So what is indication, what is surprise, what does novelty look like? So here's some uh, real snippets from real communications during real incidents. Um, so indications that people are surprised is actually quite easy. You don't have to have a degree in qualitative uh, research and data analysis. Um, you know what this looks like. When you find contrasting mental models, people trying to make sense out of what's happening, asking each other questions, taking information, observations that others are giving them, and fleshing out the gaps or the sort of mysteries that they have to make sense of what's happening is happening almost fluidly, especially for teams who have been working together for a long time. And in some cases, uh, 
you know, Slack or ISC transcript, transcripts give a unique window, especially with remote teams. As a researcher, we love that because uh, quite often when you have people who are co-located and they're doing it in video conference or just audio, um, incident transcripts t tend, especially with, re with really uh, successful, really progressive teams, um, you know, these, these communications sound a little bit like this. Hey, did you, yeah, what, uh, no, mm -mm, that's not today. Yeah, but no, I checked that. I don't think, do you think, all right, yeah, can you, I've got it, I'm on it. Okay, cool. What did you find? No, no, shit, shit, okay. Um, not a lot from a research perspective to go on there. Um, means you gotta double down on your interviewing. Anyway. Why not? Why wouldn't you look at um, incidents with severe consequences? I'll say it this way. Scrutiny from stakeholders with face-saving agenda tend to block deep inquiry. These medium severe incidents, the cost of getting details, right? The worst case scenario is you get engineers talking to you. And you're like, look, I don't know why we're talking. It wasn't that big of a deal. Exactly. It wasn't that big of a deal. The, that is why we need to know more details about it. Because it wasn't a big deal, which means that there's stuff that you did. What are stuff that you know? The thing about resilience engineering research and finding resilience in the wild, uh, especially in software, relies a great deal on tacit knowledge elicitation. And the thing about experts is that experts are not necessarily expert about what makes them an expert, right? They don't know what they know. And in fact, some cases, muscle memory is the only other explanation. Oh, I just felt, it just didn't feel right. Something was weird. There are techniques. The NTSB trains them all the time in their investigators. There are techniques to, 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 uh, to unearth this tacit knowledge. So Goldilocks incidents are the ideal. Initiative. There are, I'm just going to give, so there are multiple, I'm going to link to a couple of papers at the very end. There are a, a number of essential characteristics of resilience that sort of bear out across multiple domain um, case studies and research in the field. Initiative is one of them. It's only one of many, but it's a bit of a, this is a sort of a wet your appetite. So bear with me with a bit of a, a sort of a, oh, um, uh, academic sounding description here. Initiative is the ability of a unit, an adaptive unit, a team, for example, um, to adapt when the plan no longer fits the situation as seen from that unit's perspective. The willingness, even the audacity, to adapt planned activities to work around impasses or to seize opportunities in order to meet, better meet the goals or intent behind the plan. And when taking the initiative, the unit begins to adapt on its own using information and knowledge available at that point without asking for and then waiting for explicit authorization or tasking from other units. This is uh, initiative in the manifestation, of the expression of initiative is something that you would look for to find sources of resilience. Not all incidents have sources of resilience. This is a element that if you can identify is there. I'm going to give you a case where it wasn't. And what I would say is then a case of brittleness, um, an absence of, of initiative. 2010, Knight Capital, uh, 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 trading uh, algorithmic hedge fund trading firm. Um, raise your hand if you've heard of this incident. All right, then great. Let's, let's just surf through the, detail, the summary. Um, new changes were deployed to participate in a new market. Unexpected algorithmic mechanisms um, basically just set unbounded um, automated trading activity. The team rolled back the changes, and the situation got much worse, seven times worse. Um, and at the time, the team did not believe it had authority to halt the system. And they were relatively nervous to go to management because they didn't have a good understanding. They didn't want to go to management to ask about halting because they didn't feel comfortable or confident that they could explain what they knew about what was happening. And $440 million loss in 20 minutes. Um, interestingly, a handful of years later, the New York Stock Exchange experienced some leading indicators that 
said something that something wasn't wrong, something wasn't quite right. And, uh, and they escalated, they immediately got to all of the authority that they needed and they halted all trading on New York Stock Exchange. And they took it down for four hours. And while they worked out, it wasn't a, it, what it, it didn't, uh, 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 it, it didn't experience the type of financial loss that this had. But of course, when you, when you do something like that, um, everybody was really pissed off that they took it down for four hours. So you're kind of screwed if you don't, and you're screwed if you do. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, like, let's bring it from this abstract to your world. So in responding to an incident, it's a handful of questions to get you sort of thinking around these terms. Uh, do you have access to contact details for everyone in your organization? If you go with the idea that it's, you won't be able to know ahead of time who you might need to speak with, at what time, when you need, uh, uh, about what, can you think about any actions that you absolutely need permission to take? Or are there scenarios where you are granted explicit authority to take decisions as the shepherds and sort of escorts of production systems to make those sacrifice decisions, to halt your system, for example? Are there, do you have the ability to flip all feature flags at your disposal is another way of thinking about it. Um, what repercussions exist for violating procedures? Or, ready? Relaxing compliance. This is my, the last question I want you to think about, which is can you anticipate what neighboring or related teams need in the future that you have, that they may need that you have, expertise, resources, that sort of thing, and can donate to them these resources before they need it, even if it sacrifices some of your local goals? If so, this is a manifestation, expression of resilience, adaptive behavior that can be borrowed, donated, and in a reciprocal relationship when it's necessary. This brings us to, we're almost done here, brings us to this question, which is, can resilience be engineered? Given everything I've told you about resilience, can it be engineered? And I'm going to be honest here. This is the answer. Maybe. Um, there are um, more over the last couple years, there are more signs, glimmers of hope um, that have emerged um, that I can't, that we don't, I don't have enough time to talk about um, in other domains. Mostly those domains are in intelligence analysis. And there are papers. You, I will, you'll see them in the resilience papers. Um, dot club, um, in uh, emergency um, emergency room units, in um, in hospitals and trauma centers, and uh, and there are a couple of cases, um, or at least one case in software that's um, that's being worked out at the moment, um, and 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 sort of being explored and, and, and written about. So, here are the challenges, and here's where the, this is the controversial bit. Uh, what are the challenges with the DevOps community sort of embracing some of this stuff? Well, first is inertia towards the status quo and oversimplifications. Um, realize how long, it, this is 40 minutes and I haven't even scratched the surface, and this stuff is pretty abstract. I don't worry about that because this is also the crowd that is making some pretty good progress with understanding distributed systems. And if you can understand a, a distributed systems paper, then, Jesus, you can understand a resilience engineering paper. Um, I would say, as a whole, in software, we don't have a great ability, almost an inability, chronic inability, to learn from other domains. Why? Because we, you know, unfortunately, Silicon Valley ruined it for everybody who's not in Silicon Valley, which means that we're always pretty full of ourselves. Pretty much we invented everything, and anything else uh, invented elsewhere was no good. Um, I'm only half sarcastic. The last is techno, fetishes, techno fetishization and automation naivete. What I would say on this point is that this is expected. We are software engineers. If our first, if the first 
idea that comes to your mind is, wait, can I automate some of what you're talking about? Wait, what tool do you use? Wait, which, what, what, uh, you know, what, what, what plotting, what do you think about observability? This is about cognitive work, it's not about tools. Um, and so these are gonna be, if we start from these principles and then build tools to, to help us, after we understand what we're building for, then we've got a shot. So these status quo beliefs, really quickly, the tyranny of metrics and shallow data. Um, raise your hand if in your organization there's a, a, a person in senior leadership that you have to make a graph about with a bunch of data about incidents. Sometimes bar graphs. Um, yeah, there's another slide about that at the end. Um, uh, an underinvestment in real incident analysis expertise. What passes for productive and effective postmortems right now is hello world, um, and in fact might be actively harmful. Come talk to me later, and I'll expand more on that. Um, probably longer than you would want to listen to me. Um, oversimplified models such as one size fits all. So I want to leave you with this last little bit before I summarize, which is this inconvenient realities of shallow data. In order to understand where resilience manifests in the wild, which is necessary in order it to have any notion of being able to engineer it, we have to see what it looks like and see how it manifests in context. Um, then we need to be able to look deeper into incidents. What prevents us from looking deeper into incidents is the notion that we can describe sufficiently what an incident has to tell us with this really sort of skeletal shallow data. Mean time to X numbers are negotiated. These are not objective, they are negotiated, and also they're averages. Um, all incident data is reactive, right? It's scoped to the events that you, that you are, you have your focus on events. You're, you don't have, there's, where is your denominator? Your denominator is all of the events that could have happened but didn't. This is the paradox of resilience engineering, to look for and accentuate and enhance all of the things that normally prevents issues from happening. Not an absence of incidents, but the presence of, of capabilities that prevent incidents normally. Trending frequency and, and mean time to blah, 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 blah tells us nothing about learning, it tells us nothing about prevention, tells us nothing about expertise, proactiveness, or adaptive capacity. It does, apparently, have value from a marketing standpoint, um, or at least from an ITIL certification standpoint but it doesn't tell you anything. If you, if you show me a graph of your incidents and mean time to things going down, I will not believe that you're learning. It's not evidence of learning. It's evidence that, you, that a number of people have worked out how to make a graph look good. Okay, bottom line revisited. It's a field, it's a community. It's something a system has, something a system does. It's not what it has. It's not a property. You do not reach a resilient state and then you do and stay and maintain that. It is sustained adaptive capacity to unforeseen. Keyword unforeseen. We've got challenges here. If you want to talk more about this, uh, I'm on Twitter. And here are a handful of things that's helped fuel some of the notions here. My, my hope is that you're sufficiently uh, intrigued that I'm either, there's something here, this guy's got something here, or you're, I'm absolutely full of shit. It, regardless, both of those outcomes are great for me. Um, so, thank you.